Okay, so we are recording now. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Um, this is um, um, the lecture number 15 and the last lecture of this course. So, so today I want to um, close our, let's say, journey that we, we had until now um, with uh, two things. I want to tell you about how a system, a quantum system can be described dynamically, namely, how do you describe uh, um, the evolution in time of a quantum system? And then I want to um, elaborate with some details um, on the so-called simple harmonic oscillator that will be uh, the basis uh, of many other uh, applications and uh, areas in physics. So you're going to use that in quantum field theory, condensed matter and, and quantum optics and so on. But before that, let me just make a short recap about what we, um, about what we discussed yesterday. And uh, our discussion was precisely on the definition of position and momentum operators. And we have seen that um, uh, position and momentum, they are um, operators that uh, do not commute. So X hat and P hat, if you're taking the same component, namely the component one and the component one, you're going to get uh, that the commutator of these operators. It's I H bar. So position and momentum do not commute. And this is extremely non-trivial. I mean, from the point of view of, of, uh, um, of the consequences that it will have for the physical description of a quantum system, this is highly non-trivial. But before I elaborate a bit more on the consequences of that, um, um, I just told you that um, if you have a state uh, that describes a quantum system, psi, um, we can represent this state in the position space basis. And for that, you start with your state, you act with the identity on, on, on the state, and this identity can be written uh, um, as the sum over all uh, uh, projectors in position space. And this sum, since this is a continuum variable, is replaced by an integral. So you just insert this identity, which is the integral of this outer product. And this bra glues with this cat, and you get this representation here. So you have this scalar product between the bra x and the cat psi times the cat x. And this inner product x psi is what we call the wave function. So this is the object that we, um, we have talked about several lectures ago that uh, encodes the wave behavior of quantum systems. And um, as I said, all the things that I mentioned along this course could be phrased in terms of the wave function of the system and not a general and abstract cat psi, but rather an explicit representation in posi position space, which is the psi x. And many courses, they start when you are learning quantum mechanics for the first time. Um, they start doing everything in this language using uh, the wave function. And I mean, there is nothing wrong with that. And you can just proceed with all the postulates that I, I, I made in this course using the wave function. But um, I think that when you work with a um, 
a state that is just two entries a state, you get, I mean, more easily many results. And this is also the front door for quantum computing. And I mean, you, you can learn how to deal with states in this two level system language. And from that, you generalize things and get to the wave function. So this way is easier, in my opinion, than starting from the wave function and then making things more and more abstract. But this is a matter of taste. I just think that the, the way that we, we, we did um, is easier for you if you want to, to understand quickly quantum computing. But in any case, uh, and also I think doing calculations with uh, two entries uh, vectors is much simpler than doing with uh, functions. But anyway, this is a personal test. And I can also rephrase the scalar product between two states in the language of wave functions. So if I have the scalar product between beta and alpha, I can insert an identity here, and this will give beta x, x alpha. But x alpha, by definition, is just the wave function associated to, to alpha. So I write this as psi alpha x, and this is nothing but the, I mean, I'm just changing the order of the scalar product x beta, which would be the wave function uh, associated with beta. So this is nothing but the wave function psi star, because I'm exchanging the order, so this is the complex conjugate. So in the end, I'm just rephrasing this scalar product as this integral of a complex conjugate psi beta and um, um, the wave function associated with psi. So you see that I can just phrase this scalar product in the language of wave functions and there is nothing wrong with that. Um, we also have seen that when you have an operator, you can ask, what is the matrix element associated with this operator? And in order to, to find this out, you have to sandwich this operator with states alpha and beta. But if I want to actually write the uh, matrix elements uh, of this operator, I can just insert an identity here, sorry. I can just insert an identity here and an identity here using uh, the integral over xi, uh, sorry x prime and x prime prime. So I'm just introducing two identities, this one and this one. And you see that here I will have this scalar product that is nothing but psi beta star, as we just saw here. This scalar product will be psi alpha, as we saw here, but there is this sandwich in between. So this sandwich is the action of the position operator on the cat x prime prime. But x operator acting on x prime prime, by definition, we saw that yesterday, is just the number x prime prime times the cat x prime prime. So this is the eigenvalue of this operator with this eigenstate. So in the end, this, the action of this operator on this cat is giving me a number times a cat. So it's a number, I can pull this out of this scalar product and I can continue with um, the operation. So see what is written here. This is written psi star and then comes bra x prime x double prime which is um, number and x double prime cat psi alpha x double prime. So the structure that I just read to you is exactly what is written here. 
And now I have to use the property that I explained to you yesterday. The scalar product between a bra put, uh, uh, associated with a position, with a cat associated with a position, is a delta function. Okay? So it's a Dirac delta function. So I replace these by a Dirac delta function. And now comes the property that some of you said that you didn't know, that if you have the integral over dx prime, dx double prime, psi star beta, x prime, x double prime, and then I will continue downstairs. Delta x prime minus x double prime, psi alpha x double prime. So if I have this integral, you see that the delta function is, is the argument of the delta functions is x prime minus x double prime. And this function has the following property. If I integrate over x double prime, this delta function will give a non-zero value just when x prime prime is equal to x prime. So it's very similar to the Kronecker delta. The Kronecker delta, delta ij, will just give to you a non-vanishing value when j is equal to i. So this is exactly what is going on here. This delta function will filter just the value of x prime prime, which is equal to x prime. But you have to sum over all possible x prime prime, which is an integral. So when I integrate over x double prime, everything that is in my integrand with x prime prime will become an x prime. So this is the amazing property of the delta Dirac function. So when I integrate here over x prime prime, everything that looks x prime prime will be x prime. So this guy will become x prime, and this argument here will become x prime. And I used the integral d over dx prime prime to do that. So in the end, this expression here reduces to the, this expression here. Okay? So what I'm concluding is that the matrix element of the position operator in the states alpha, beta is represented by this quantity here is the integral of dx prime and then comes the wave function associated with the state beta complex conjugate x prime, this is a number now, this is not an operator, this is just a number, times the psi alpha associated with the cat alpha. Okay? So, I'm saying that if you want to compute this matrix element, you have to do this integral here. This is what it is. And you see that the x hat is actually just a number. Okay, when you use this, this uh, basis here. Good. Um, well, if you wanted to compute the matrix element of not x hat, but a function of x hat, so you can, you know, an example of a function is x hat squared. So this is a function of the operator x hat. Another example is x hat to the n, so this is another function. You can prove, and this is an exercise that you know I leave to you, but I'm happy to discuss if, if you want to solve that. I'm happy to receive emails and, and discuss. Um, you, you can show that these expectation, sorry, not expectation, well, that this matrix element of f uh, hat can be written as the integral of these wave functions with the function now calculated at, at the number x prime. So this is not a function of an operator, but this is a function of a number. So this is just a standard function. Okay. Um, 
now, uh, well, you know, I'm using a lot the position space basis here. I'm introducing um, the identity in the position space, which is the integral uh, over dx and then the outer product xx. But you could also ask, what is the momentum, what is the representation of the momentum operator in the basis of position eigenstates? Um, there are many different uh, possibilities to show that, okay? But again, I don't want to um, devote a lot of time in proving that. But rather, I'll just tell you the result and use it. So you can find books that will explain to you in detail this. Um, and I can, if you want to see a detailed derivation, I can refer the, the, you to the books. But uh, for a first look at that, uh, I think it's just uh, an unnecessary complication. So first, you just look at the results, and then you try to understand what happened, okay? So, what I want to do is the following. I want uh, to compute this expectation value of the momentum operator in a state alpha, which by definition is just this sandwich here. And now, uh, I just insert here and here identities in the position space. So I'm introducing a double integral, and then I have the first identity here, the second identity here, and uh, I have this matrix element, which is uh, the matrix element of the position operator in the position uh, 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 basis. So, this becomes a wave function, this becomes a wave function, it's written here and here, and now I want to compute this guy. And this is what you can really prove what is the form uh, that it takes, but I'm not going to prove, I'm going to state what is the form. So the form, and this is, you have to be careful to understand that, the form is the following. Uh, the matrix element of the momentum operator in the position space is just minus i h bar and then i'm introducing a delta function so delta function and then i just take these values of x x prime minus x prime prime times a derivative with respect to x prime so look this is the matrix element of an operator and if you look at the right-hand side, you have an operator because the derivative is an operator. The derivative acts on a function and gives you another function. So this is an operator. So you see that this looks very different from what we have seen before. Before, we just looked at operators as being matrices, two by two matrices. And you see that when I go to the position space, I'm taking, I'm looking at this operator and it takes the form of a differential operator, okay? This might sound weird in the beginning, but the, you can think of that as the following. If I want to represent the momentum operator in the position space, this behaves as a derivative and actually, uh, this is something that becomes very natural uh, um, um, at some point. Um, okay, so given that this is true, and again, this you can find uh, the derivation in, in several books, different derivations. Well, some of them are not really derivations, they are just motivations, but um, you can make things uh, reasonably precise. Uh, if you if you if you just look at um, um, more advanced books, but okay, given this fact, I will just plug this expression here in the integral, and when I do that, I have 
this structure, I have the wave function associated with alpha, conjugated. Then I have this operator that I just wrote, acting on psi. So you see the word that I'm using. I'm acting with this operator on psi, OK? It turns out that the operator associated with the position operator in the position basis is just a multiplication by a number. But the position operator is a derivative. So you have to obey the rules. And again, I can use the property of the delta function. So I can integrate over dx double prime. So I'll kill the second integral. And every x double prime will become an x prime. And in the end, I have this expression here. So what I'm seeing is that the expectation value of the momentum operator in the state alpha is just the integral of the wave function of alpha complex conjugated times the, well, there is this numerical factor, times the derivative of the wave function of alpha. So there is nothing wrong with this expression. I'm just saying that this operator acts on a function. But um, you can, uh, uh, of course, I mean, this is not the most natural thing. Uh, so you can, I, I totally understand if you find that weird. But um, of course, um, now I'm telling you that the, the, the position and the momentum operators in position space, they act as a multiplication by a number and the other one as the derivative of the function. So we know that the, the commutator of x hat and p hat, they have a well-defined form. I mean, we just, we just learned that here. And now I have an explicit expression for the, comp for the, for the operators x hat and p hat in the position space. So of course, um, if this representation is correct, then the commutator should be the one that I, I, I wrote before. But you see, um, the commutator is an operation that takes two operators and, and gives you back another operator. And operators, they act on something. So if I want to look at the position space representation of these operators, I will act with this operator, which is the commutator, on a test function. So this function is just any function. So I'm acting with this operator on a function. And I want to know if this commutator is going to give uh, this result here, which is I H bar. So, um, well, I can just write the definition of the commutator. It will be X hat P hat minus P hat X hat acting on the function F. And then I can use the linearity of this to write X hat P hat acting on F minus P hat X hat acting on F. And then I just call this expression A, just call this expression B, and then I'm going to do the calculation of A and B separately. So A says the following, acting, act on F with P, and then act with X on the result. So how does P act on a function F? Well, I just told you that you have to replace it by minus i h bar times the derivative operator. So p hat acting on f will give to you this derivative. And now you, you have to act with x hat on a function. And you also uh, learned that the action of the x hat operator on a function is just a number x times the function, OK? Now, if I act on a different order, so if I act, act with p hat on x hat on 
f. Well, acting with x hat on f will give me a number x times the function. Now I have to act with p hat on this product here. So this will be, you replace p hat by minus i h bar d dx. And now this d dx is acting on everything. So you see how careful you have to be because the operator acts on everything that's after it. So the derivative operator will not act just on the function f, but on the product of x uh, with the function. Well, it turns out that um, um, if you act with the derivative on this product, you first act with ddx on x and repeat f, and then you repeat x and act with ddx on f. This is just the product rule of a derivative. And the first term, well, you have ddx acting on x, so x, will, this will be just one, so you repeat the function. And the second term, well, you repeat x and derive the function f, okay? So this is a simple calculation. And now I just, yeah? Hello. Hi. Yeah, please, um, I don't get the connection between A and B. In A, we have operator x, operator B, acting on f of x. Yes. And at the end, we're getting equal to operator x into bracket, this function. But in B, uh, is the other way around. And I'm like, I'm not getting the connection. Yeah, so what, what I'm saying is that here, you first act with the derivative on, act, on f, and then you multiply by x, right? Okay. Here you act with x, then you get x, f of x, and then you act with the derivative on everything. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So, in the end, we have to take a and subtract from b, but you see that this term here is just the same as this term here. So, in the end, the commutator acting on a test function f is just i h times the function f. Well, the function f is generic. So if I act on a different function g, this will give i h g. So we say that the commutator will act on any function just as the multiplication of i h with the function. So you get this relation that was precisely the relation that I announced before. Okay, so you see that this representation of the operators really um, um, satisfy the properties, the properties that we, um, we uh, discussed before. And moreover, now that you know the commutator between X and P, you can go back to the uncertainty relation and just write, uh, what is the uncertainty relations for position and momentum? And what you get is this. You get that the uncertainty on the position times the uncertainty on the momentum is bigger or equal than h bar over two. So you see that if you start decreasing the uncertainty on x, since this must be bigger or equal than a number that is non-zero, then delta p must increase to preserve the inequality. And the other way around, if you decrease the uncertainty on p, you necessarily need to increase the uncertainty on x. And this is what people often say. If you know the position of a particle, you don't know the momentum, but if you know the momentum, you don't know the position and so on. Well, this is the precise statement, okay? Hello. Hi. Um, please, um, what is the relationship between the commutator, and eh, sorry, the commuter equals i h bar and the uncertainty uh, relation? Mm -hmm. 
I yeah. didn't have any link or differences. Yeah, let me refresh your mind about that. Um, we have derived this relation. Yeah. So you see that the uncertainties of operators, they are directly related to the commutator of these operators. Okay. 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 Yeah. 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 Good. So, um, I hope this answers the question. Yes, please. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Okay, so, well, now that you have a, a basic knowledge on uh, position and momentum, um, I want to introduce the last element before the the dynamical equation, which is the energy, the operator that gives you the energy of the system. Um, um, okay, so in order to do that, let me consider a, a particle with mass m in uh, classical physics. So if I want to describe the motion of a particle with some mass m, and this particle is subject to forces that are um, conservative forces. So they are forces that have uh, a potential energy associated with. So if I ask you what is the total energy of the particle, you are going to say the total energy of the particle is the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. Right? This is, this is how you write the total energy of the particle. And, uh, well, the kinetic energy is mv squared divided by 2. But remember, the momentum, the momentum, the absolute value of the momentum is m times the absolute value of v. So you can rewrite mv squared in terms of the momentum. And this is just... Uh, p squared divided by 2m. So you can show that this quantity here is just this quantity here. Um, so Mahmoud, uh, uh, yeah, so Mahmoud asked, how can we use classical concepts in quantum physics? We cannot, but I'm just uh, re re refreshing. How do you write the total energy in uh, classical theory? Okay, I'm not saying that this is quantum. Okay, um, so this is how you compute the total energy of a classical particle that is subject to a, to a potential energy U and which has velocity V, right? Um, there is a fancy name for the total energy. Well, for those of you that know more about that, uh, this is not always equal to the energy, but for most of the systems that we deal with, it is, uh, but we call the energy uh, for most of these interesting systems uh, as the Hamiltonian of the system. This is just, you can take it as just a fancy name for, for the energy, okay? So the total energy of a system is, can also be called the Hamiltonian of the system. So instead of just because we want to get fancy, I will say, that I know, instead of saying I know the total energy of the particle, I will say that I know the Hamiltonian of the particle. And the Hamiltonian is just the sum of the kinetic energy with the potential energy. Okay? Um, so you see that, um, also I'm assuming that the potential energy just depends on x, just depends on the position of the particle. Okay? Good. So you see that in this quantity, I have momentum and I have the position of the particle that is inside this function u. Okay. Now, uh, we want to uh, uh, learn how to describe the energy operator or, as I said, in the fancy uh, way, the Hamiltonian operator for a quantum system, okay? And in order to do so, you follow what we call, and that is also fancy, 
a quantization rule, okay? So you start with your classical Hamiltonian that is given by this expression. And um, we are going to um, um, take the following uh, um, um, rule. If you want to define the Hamiltonian uh, for the quantum system, so the Hamiltonian operator, you, well, first of all, I want to call it an operator, so I put a hat on it, so now this is an operator. But how does this operator is defined? Well, you just promote your momentum to, uh, to the momentum operator that you just learned about. And you promote the position x to the operator associated with the position. So now the Hamiltonian operator is just p hat squared. So this is an operator now divided by twice the mass of the particle plus the potential energy that is a function of the position operator. So I'm really just, you know, replacing numbers that are standard quantities in classical physics to operators. And this is the quantum Hamiltonian. This is the Hamiltonian of my quantum system, okay? This is, of course, you see, I'm not, th this arrow here, this does not have a mathematical precise definition as I'm stating here. This is just a quantization rule. This is a rule that you have to follow in order to construct the operator that will give you the energy for quantum systems. So this is a rule, okay? So there is something in the chat. Um, why do we always uh, do away with the spin energy of elementary particles in Hamilton? Well, a uh, good question. We didn't have time to talk about spin, but spin is a very important concept in quantum mechanics. Um, here, I'm assuming that my classical particle is first a particle that does not have spin, and also that is really a particle, so it does not have dimension in such a way that it rotates, uh, um, um, it does not rotate along uh, an axis that, you know, pass through the, 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 the particle. So it's really just a point particle, and I'm assuming that this point particle has no spin. But for instance, if you want to describe the electron, the electron has spin. You cannot, you cannot forget that. So if you want to describe the electron, you, you, you have to include the spin of the electron, okay? Good, so we, uh, we have seen the quantization rule to get the Hamiltonian operator. And now if I want to represent this Hamiltonian in position space, as we did with p hat and x hat in the previous slide, I just replace p hat and x hat by the operators that we defined in the previous slide. So remember, the momentum operator was minus i h bar derivative with respect to x. So since you have momentum squared, this will be h bar squared. The, mi the, the minus i squared becomes just minus 1. So I have the minus here. And since you have derivative squared, this is the same as the second derivative. And the position representation of the x uh, of, of, of the x hat operator is just the number x. So whenever I see an, uh, an x hat, I just replace it by x. And I multiply by the identity to remind you that this is an operator. So now, if I act with my Hamiltonian on a wave function, so the Hamiltonian acting on a wave function gives to me this quantity here, which is the second derivative of the wave function times this factor, and uh, the product between the potential energy times the wave function. So this is the uh, position representation of the Hamiltonian uh, acting on a wave function. 
and you see that uh, you see that this is the classical expression for the Hamiltonian and this is the quantum expression for my Hamiltonian and you see that I get an H bar here so you see that the quantum Hamiltonian involves this constant that appeared in the first lecture of this course okay so this is how deep the the idea that Planck had uh, came along okay okay now we are ready to answer the question that how um, if I know so let's let's think about classical physics if I have a system that I know the position and the velocity at some um, initial condition so I know the position of the particle and its velocity at time t equals to t0 I can use Newton's law to tell you what will be the position of the particle in the future t equals to t prime but just knowing what is the position the initial position and initial velocity of the, the particle is not enough you need an equation that is Newton's law that tells you how the system evolves with time here we spend three weeks essentially trying to define what, what how to to describe a quantum state right but now comes a very important question how does this state evolves with time okay so if i have a system that has a state and this state uh, and this system is subject to forces and so on how does this state change with the flow of time and what i'm asking is given the state of the particle of, of a quantum system actually at time t equals t zero what will be the state of the system at time t in the future if you know the system is subject to some uh, um, potential and so on so the equation that describes to you how the state evolves in time is the so-called Schrodinger equation so this is the equation that gives you the quantum dynamics and this is a very simple equation it is written here it tells you that the time derivative of your state times this numerical factor so you see that in the equation enters a complex number but the derivative of this state is equal to the Hamiltonian of the system so the operator the Hamiltonian operator acting on the system so the evolution of the system is totally connected to the Hamiltonian of it so the Hamiltonian is the operator that dictates the time evolution of the system okay so this is the so-called Schrodinger equation but of course you can write this in position space representation as we did here with the Hamiltonian and if you do so oh sorry if you do so you are going to get uh, the Schrodinger equation in position space representation which is I uh, H bar time derivative of the wave function is just the Hamiltonian that we have written before acting on the wave function okay so this is a differential equation that you have to solve so you have to solve what is the function psi that satisfies this equation given some initial condition but let me make some comments here um, this is a very difficult equation to solve in general um, and typically there are some forms of potential energy that you we know how to solve um, so you can choose for instance if this potential energy is the potential energy between 
the nucleus of a hydrogen atom and the electron that is uh, orbiting the, the, the nucleus. So the potential energy is just the electric potential energy, and we know how to solve that. And then you can get back all those results that we discussed in the beginning of the course for the hydrogen atoms by solving the Schrodinger equation. Unfortunately, we don't have time to discuss that, but you can solve the dynamics of the hydrogen atom using this equation. Um, also, let me just stress a very important thing. You see that you have the second derivative of, with respect to x here, while this equation also involves the first derivative of time. And in the course of relativity, you learned that actually, uh, when you talk about relativity, time and space, they have a similar role so the, you you define not space and time but you define space time and this equation treats time and space differently okay also in quantum mechanics time is not an operator time is just a parameter while position is an operator so um, this theory you might guess, uh, will not be compatible with relativity, will not be compatible with uh, even special relativity. And you can construct a theory of relativistic quantum mechanics, and in the end, you show that this theory is what is called quantum field theory. So this is what we call non-relativistic quantum mechanics. For many applications, I mean, condensed matter, um, quantum computing, and many applications, you don't care much about the relativistic nature of, of, you know, of the universe because uh, the effects are very tiny. So this equation is a very good description. But if you want to find a theory that is compatible with the principles of special relativity, you have to go further. And this, uh, this will lead uh, a theory that is uh, quantum field theory. If you want to write down a Quantum a quantum theory that is compatible with general relativity, then you enter the field of quantum gravity, which is <laughs> unknown or uncharted territory. We know very few things about that. Okay. Okay. So um, in this course, I decided to not. St because I could have started the course with this equation and just teach you how to solve these equations for different potentials and so on. But I wanted to rather give you a general view of the framework behind quantum mechanics. Okay. So I wanted to tell you what are the postulates and how to, to make, uh, how to use quantum mechanics in practice for the definition of states and how to really find the wave function inside quantum mechanics instead of solving um, the Schrodinger equations for many different potentials. But this, of course, is a very important exercise. You have to practice that. So um, um, I can give you several references where you can see how to solve the Schrodinger equations for different potentials you. Um, I will, uh, well, actually, I will not even solve the Schrodinger equation, but I will tell you the steps and the technology that people use to um, at least elaborate on this side of the Schrodinger equation um, for the simple harmonic oscillator. And this will be in the second part of this lecture, okay? 
that I will give the example of the harmonic oscillator. Um, and as I'm going to argue, this is, uh, I mean, the te technique that you develop to solve this system is really uh, very important for different branches of physics. So it will be very important for quantum field theory, condensed matter, and so on. So this will be in part two. And with that, I mean, if you understand this part and, uh, uh, I mean, if you understand everything that I said up to now, at least to cer certain degree, I mean, of course, there are many things that you have to digest, um, then I think you can say that you, you have the fundamental tools to, to start doing quantum mechanics at, at the practical level, okay? So, I will give you the break now, a 10 minutes break, and then we come back for the second part. So, I see you in 10 minutes. Bye.